be upon you all. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah and welcome to another session of the evolution course. And uh, first I have to say that um, there has been a stop from my side for the last month and uh, the last point we stopped one was um, session eight where we were discussing actually the genetic code and uh, some of the participants told me that the session was a little bit jittery because I used uh, to share my screen to show some videos. So in this session, I thought maybe to continue or maybe to recap first before we continue. And then I think we will just recap because this um, topic of the genetic code is a very, very important topic to understand um, why the theory of evolution cannot be true. Uh, and the reason is that the alternative to evolution is essentially design. And we know design when we see things that are pers purposefully implemented. And one of the great things that will show us how there is a very obvious signature of design is the genetic code itself, because the genetics code for information that build the rest of the body. And our human experience is that information can only be the product of a mind. And we know that something is information when we see this information manifest into something. For example, if this is the design of a machine and you have this design on um, a hard disk or a chip, and then you run this design so it produces a machine that is intricately designed, we know that this information codes for something specific. If you give this information, for example, to a 3D printer and it prints, it prints a machine that works intricately together, one piece after the other is produced by the code and then those pieces come together to produce a working machine, then we know that those codes are not random codes but are rather a purposely coded information to produce a machine where each part fits in a specific part of the machine. Now, in our case, we are looking into code um, that is written on the DNA and hence this code essentially codes for the body of the creature. So we have this sophisticated system which we can call the genetic system. And first, I would like to point you to uh, go to um, the, um, the page of the course and go specifically to Article 8. And for you to be able to do that, I am now giving you the address now of the article so you can open it from your side. Um, and you can essentially review what we are going to say in this session after the session. And... Uh, um, the reason we have this in the form of a course is that you can uh, have it later and um, uh, review it and uh, you can even answer quizzes, etc. So the purpose of this course is not just to give you information, but to make you capable of uh, discussing this information, explaining it to your children, uh, discussing it with people who deny that... Uh, um, Creatures, including human beings, are essentially designed and created. So we will be going through um, this uh, session, um, uh, session 8, through Article 8, and we'll be going in sequence. And when you go to Article 8, you will find that I am making an analogy between my own uh, speciality, which is uh, uh, um, electronics and communication and computer engineering, and the human cell. And the reason this is the case is that there is a huge, really a huge amount of similarity. So here is the address of the, the lesson. You go to the um, findingtruthchannel.com, courses is evolution true or false, lessons, genetic code is design, which is actually Article 8. Okay, or you can just click on the link that I have pinned now to the live chat. Okay, I'll also have it in the video description. Okay, so... The living cell. The living cell is a hyper complex, hyper sophisticated piece of living thing, living material. Um, to appreciate this, one eukaryotic cell, as we have said, 
contains some 42 million machines. And a machine in this case is just a molecule. A protein molecule essentially functions as a machine, and we have seen examples, and we are going to see them to see them more of them today in uh, uh, better visuals. And those parts, when you have an engineering system, we know that the number of interactions and hence the number of potential problems that can arise in the system is proportional to the square of the parts. So if you have a system that has one part, obviously there can only be one problem. If it's um, five parts, then you can have five to the power two, that's 25 problems. So from one to five goes from one to 25 numbers of problems. If you have 100 parts, you have 100 square potential problems, so you have 10,000 problems. So from 1 to 100, the number of parts increases by 100, but the number of problems increases by 10,000. However, we have each single cell in our body that is um, composed of eukaryotic cells has 42 million protein molecules. Each one is essentially a machine. And we have 30 to 40 trillion cells in our body. And some further 30 to 40 trillion bacterial uh, 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 cells in our body. But let's focus on our body. You have 30, let's so say 40 trillion cells, each one having 42 million protein molecules. Can you imagine the number of problems and the number of accidents and the number of issues that can arise from the interactions of those 42 million trillion parts that we are made of? The number itself is unimaginable. However, we wake up in the morning, we go through our day, we eat and drink and excrete and breathe and sweat and move and make sports and think and talk and interact and finish our day and go to sleep and everything regenerates and we start a new day, all happening in a smooth, unbelievably harmonized way. When you think of those amounts of parts and amounts of cells in your own body, it is an unfathomable engineering problem that this thing even works. Imagine your car, how many parts are in your car? Few thousands, tens of thousands. Your body has 40 trillion, trillion. So you have a million, a thousand million is a billion, and then a thousand billion is a trillion, and you have 40 trillion cells. Your body is 40 trillion parts. Each part, in terms of proteins only, has 42 million protein molecules. Each is a machine. Set aside the carbohydrates and the lipids and the other fatty acids, etc. So you have like billions of trillions of parts, but we still work. And part of the, of, of, of the charm, part of the magic, part of the magnificence of this is in the genetic system. So the genetic system is very important to biology. Uh, there is something called the central dogma of biology. The central dogma of biology says that the genetic information, in simple language, genetic information is stored into DNA. DNA goes into, DNA replicates, okay? So to make more copies, so you end up having all those trillions of cells. And um, when those cells are functioning, the DNA is transcribed, that is like read. So the DNA is like information on a hard disk. It's read into RNA. So RNA is another kind of an information molecule, but it is more usable to produce something. So it can be further translated. So you, if, remember the terms, because those terms are very important for the dialogue. So DNA stores information. DNA is replicated, so you can have all those cells. DNA is transcribed into something else called RNA, another molecule that carries genetic information. And then RNA is translated into proteins. And proteins build our bodies and do functions. And they are involved in so many reactions. And some of them are called enzymes. And those enzymes are catalysts to reactions. And uh, uh, RNA plus proteins also create uh, uh, machines. And those machines also have functions etc etc so this process replication transcription and translation and then we have a protein then we have protein folding and then protein transport 
is a very, very, very important chain of events that is essential for the being of the living organism and sustaining his life. Um, I'm making here an analogy, as I am telling you, like the cell is essentially like a supercomputer. Okay, the cell is like a supercomputer. So imagine that each cell, so you have like 40 trillion supercomputers in your body. Okay, now how they are coordinated and how they talk together is another complete different, completely different ball game that we can lately address. But let's just look into one cell. So one cell, if it's a supercomputer, you know, computers do not work without programs. Computers do not work without data. So the first thing you need to think of is where is the information? Imagine that you go to the shop and you buy yourself a computer or a laptop. No matter how smart or fast or magnificent uh, uh, keyboard or great screen this laptop has, if it doesn't have an operating system and it doesn't have programs on it running on top of the operating systems and those programs don't have data, then it is like a piece of uh, metal. It has, it has no value. So the first central part of the system is what? is your information storage. You need your hard disk. And obviously, you need a processor to process the information. You need memory so that the memory can run, etc. So the first thing we are going to look at is where this information is stored. And we have all um, um, uh, probably have heard the term chromosomes, right? Uh, what are chromosomes? So chromosomes is the medium or actually is the aggregation of your genetic information. So this molecule called DNA is aggregated into chromosomes. Um, DNA is very, very, very small, very, very, very thin. And DNA is formed of a sequence of uh, information, of bits. But bits in a computer are, are either zero or one. Um, bits that we use in our counting are from zero to nine. So like decimal, it's a decimal system. On computer, it's a binary system, so zero or one. In DNA, it is not from zero to one and not zero to nine. It's each letter can take one of four values, okay? Zero, one, two, three, let's say. So you imagine a system where the computer, instead of zero or one, has zero, one, and two, and three. Uh, this system has um, magnificent um, mathematical reasons that we are not going to go through now, but just know this information. And instead of saying 0, 1, 2, 3, they are uh, uh, four actually distinct chemicals. And each one of those chemicals is called a nucleotide. It is essentially uh, uh, a molecule, okay? And they are arranged one after the other, so we can have A, T, or C, or G. And from this sequence, like there is zeros and ones in the computer, information is stored. Um, how does this information get stored? Let's look at our first video. And this time, I'm streaming the videos directly from the streaming platform. So we will get much better um, graphics than the previous episode. So let's have the first one. In this animation, we'll see the remarkable way our DNA is tightly packed up to fit into the nucleus of every cell. The process starts with assembly of a nucleosome, which is formed when eight separate histone protein subunits attach to the DNA molecule. The combined tight loop of DNA and protein is the nucleosome. Multiple nucleosomes are coiled together, and these then stack on top of each other. The end result is a fiber of packed nucleosomes known as chromatin. This fiber, which at this point is condensed to a thickness of 30 nanometers, is then looped and further packaged using other proteins which are not shown here. This remarkable multiple folding allows six feet of DNA to fit into the nucleus of each cell in our body, an object so small that 10,000 nuclei could fit on the tip of a needle. The end result is that the DNA is tightly packed into the familiar structures we can see through a microscope, chromosomes. It is important to realize that chromosomes are not always present. They form only when cells are dividing. 
At other times, as we can see here at the end of cell division, our DNA becomes less highly organized. So I hope you have enjoyed that. This is how chromosomes are formed. You have those strands of DNA with the information arranged into them. They are looped like the fibers that you have seen. And a nanometer, in the video it says it is as thick as three nanometers, if I remember correctly. A nanometer is one over thousand over million. All right, one of over a thousand of a millionth of a meter. This is what a nanometer is. So imagine how very, 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 very small this thing is. However, there is a huge length of it. And it's all packed into the chromatin, into the chromosomes, into the nucleus, which is extremely small. So our cells, which, is, which are our supercomputers, have this DNA material that stores information that is so compact and so efficient in information storage. Let me tell you this. A test tube having few grams of DNA can store the whole information on the internet maybe more than once. A test tube of DNA can store almost all of the information that is in, on the internet maybe more than once. This is how compact and efficient DNA is. DNA can survive for thousands of years in good conditions. Imagine if you have a hard drive or a magnetic material and you start, you store on it something and you leave it and you come back after 10 years, maybe you will have plenty of bad sectors. After 50 years, you are sure you will have plenty of bad sectors. After 100, probably you have more bad sectors than not bad sectors. And DNA is not like that. It is a very resilient material. Its half-life is in thousands of years. Um, not millions of years. So if you have a very old fossil, the DNA will have been decomposed. But it is very efficient compared to our uh, storage media. And that's why um, this is the first aspect of our supercomputer. We have super storage. OK, now this um, information Imagine, imagine that you have a program, and this program is, um, you know, created by a company that is producing games, for example. So the company creates this game, and it's in the it's, it's in data center, it's in the company's data center. You need to play the game. You need to make a copy of it and download it to your computer so that you can play with it. So a program that cannot be replicated is probably a useless program because you can only have one copy of it. So for DNA material to be useful, for life to exist, DNA must be copyable. It, can, it must be able to be copied. Otherwise, if DNA was in this uh, cell or this organism that is created, this organism, unless the DNA can, can be copied, then the organism cannot have any offsprings. Can, and and like, once this organism dies, then we will not have any more life after it. So you need to replicate the DNA to have more than one cell into the or in the organism's body and also obviously the organism needs to replicate and produce offspring if the organism is a single uh, uh, um, uh, celled organism a unicellular organism then obviously the replication is essential both for uh, uh, reproduction and for creating copies and if the organization is a multicellular organism like us for example then creating new cells is for damage repair and for growth and for other processes and uh, essentially, we need also um, some special cells like the sperms of the ova for reproduction. In all cases, we have to be able to replicate DNA like we need to copy programs that are stored in storage to have backups, to have different uh, versions of the program to use. So the next thing we are going to look at is replication. Before replication, when you rewatch this video, contemplate on what you have just seen and think. Is this magnificent arrangement where you have the coiling of the double helix and then the, 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 the further coiling so you have filaments and then the further coiling so you have the chromatin and the, the final chromatid structure and the final chromosome structure. Does this look designed for you or a design that is just there by coincidence? 
what would have been the case if this design was not there and what kind of entanglement would the DNA material have been into and what kind of destruction would have resulted from that very important also not the histones that we have you have seen the material getting wrapped around and those proteins are specifically designed to be able to wrap DNA around them so Great, magnificent design to the extent that from this molecule, you can store the whole internet in a test tube. Completely mind-blowing. Now, let's see our next thing about how this thing can be replicated. So now we go into DNA replication, how we can get faithful copies of the data, of the information. Um, so this first video will show the process of gene replication in preparation for division. And this is the simplified version. And then we are going to see a further complicated version. Let's go. Before a cell can divide in two, it must first duplicate all of its DNA so that it can pass an exact copy to each daughter cell. DNA replication is carried out by a molecular machine called the replisome that pulls apart the double helix and makes an exact copy of each strand. Look at this the DNA magnificent DNA copy structure. enters the production line from the left. The blue ring-shaped molecule is the enzyme helicase, which unwinds the double helix into two strands. Helicase is like a turbine, The leading the strand way. is copied continuously. The lagging strand runs in the opposite direction with a more complicated copying mechanism. It is drawn out repeatedly in loops and copied one section at a time. The end result is two new DNA molecules. Wow, did you see that? These are, remember when I was, when I was telling you uh, we have 42 million molecules which are machines. This is why I was calling them machines. Did you see the turbine, the blue turbine? This thing goes around in an unbelievable speed. Tens of thousands of revolutions per minute. Tens of thousands of RPM. I think even maybe more than 100,000 RPM. Unbelievable. Now, this has just seen, you, you know the DNA has two strands and they are going in and it's separating them and then the copying mechanism. But to see more detail, let's look at the more advanced video. During DNA replication, both strands of the double helix act as templates for the formation of new DNA molecules. Copying occurs at a localized region called the replication fork, which is a Y-shaped structure where new DNA strands are synthesized by a multi-enzyme complex. Here, the DNA to be copied enters the complex from the left. One new strand is leaving at the top of frame, and the other new strand is leaving at the bottom. The first step in DNA replication is the separation of the two strands by an enzyme called helicase. This spins the incoming DNA to unravel it at 10,000 RPM in the case of bacterial systems. The separated strands are called 3' prime and 5' prime, distinguished by the direction in which their component nucleotides join up. The 3' prime DNA strand, also known as the leading strand, is diverted to a DNA polymerase and is used as a continuous template for the synthesis of the first daughter DNA helix. The other half of the DNA double helix, known as the lagging strand, has the opposite 3' prime to 5' prime orientation and consequently requires a more complicated copying mechanism. As it emerges from the helicase, the lagging strand is organized into sections called Okazaki fragments. These are then presented to a second DNA polymerase enzyme in the preferred 5' prime to 3' prime orientation. These sections are then effectively synthesized backwards. When the copying is complete, the finished section is released and the next loop is drawn back for replication. 
Intricate as this mechanism appears, numerous components have been deliberately left out to avoid complete confusion. The exposed strands of single DNA are covered by protective binding proteins, and in some systems, multiple Okazaki fragments may be present. Okay, I just like to laugh at the comment made in the video that this that so many details have been left out, otherwise it will not have been understandable. As magnificent and as sophisticated as it is already, and as mind-blowingly uh, 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 intricate, so much details have to be left out. Otherwise, you will not understand what's going on. Error correction, for example, and other many other things. And now let's look. Let's look at very clear evidence for design here. This system. Now you have this turbine, the helicase, which goes at ten thousand RPM. Okay. Other turbines in cells go at like almost 100,000, as I say, like in the um, flagellum, for example, in, 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 in ciliated uh, uh, creatures um, or flagellated creatures. This one goes at 10,000 RPM, 10,000 revolutions per minute. Can you believe that? And then you see it separates the strands, but one strand goes this direction, the other strand has the opposite direction. This system is extremely and very obviously Purposely designed, purposefully designed, because the one strand that goes in the proper direction is directly copied, as you have seen, and the other strand is copied one segment like this, and then another segment like this, and then another segment like this, and then the system will stitch them together and then glue them and then uh, seal the glue. Okay, the Okazaki uh, 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 segments that you have or fragments that you have seen. So if this is not a designed system, why wouldn't it just just go and copy? Number one, how is a system there that is designed to copy in the first place? How do those machines come together by a random process like random mutation and natural selection? Why would random mutation produce something like this? What exactly here comes from mutation? I want, I want people who are into evolutionary biology to answer me as an engineer and tell me how this thing can happen by random mutation and natural selection. And for you who want to see further about this, go back to session two of the course and you will find some very nice things, uh, a very nice discussion about that point. Now I'm taking you to a third uh, 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 thing about the replication to have a further look into this matter of the leading and the lagging strand and how the Okazaki fragments get together to see how very detailed and how purposefully designed this thing is. DNA replication is the process by which a duplicate copy of the genetic material is made before a cell divides. The steps in replication are highly conserved in all organisms. There are a few details that differ between bacteria and eukaryotes, but we focus on bacterial replication in this animation for simplicity. The process of DNA replication is broadly described as having three phases, initiation, elongation and termination. Let's begin by considering the initiation phase. For copying to take place, the double helical structure of the DNA must first be opened at a site termed the origin of replication to allow access by the machinery that will copy the DNA. This opening is regulated by a series of initiation regulatory proteins not shown here. Once open, a DNA helicase, a ring of six subunits, is loaded onto one strand of the DNA at each side of the replication bubble. This establishes two replication forks that will move away from each other as replication proceeds. The synthesis of DNA is catalyzed by an enzyme called DNA polymerase. However, DNA polymerases cannot start a new strand from scratch. Instead, they can only elongate an existing polymer of DNA or RNA. Consequently, a primer sequence needs to be made from which DNA polymerase can continue its synthesis. Primers are made by an enzyme called primase. Once access to the single strands of the DNA has been obtained, the primase is loaded onto the DNA. The primase synthesizes a small stretch of RNA by copying the sequence of nucleotides on the template strand. A DNA polymerase will later elongate this small RNA stretch. The next Note steps how are these things fall the together polymerases onto in the DNA very well to designed steps. The, the first component that is loaded is the sliding clamp. 
a ring-shaped structure that binds at the three prime end of the newly made RNA primer. To get onto DNA and encircle it, the clamp is loaded by a clamp loader complex. The five protein clamp loader complex binds to the sliding clamp and binding of ATP allows opening of the sliding clamp ring. The opened ring then encircles the template Not primer the mechanized the processes that are happening. of the primer. Interaction with the three prime end of the DNA stimulates ATP hydrolysis and the clamp loader dissociates from the DNA to be replaced by the replicative DNA polymerase. The three prime end of the See primer how is positioned get off in the polymerase on. active site to allow addition of nucleotides to this end. During elongation, the replication bubble gets bigger as the helicases move apart, establishing two replication forks that move in opposite directions. The sliding Notice clamp here he's putting it linear so that you understand. replication fork moves along the DNA as the helicase unwinds the double-stranded DNA to expose single strands. Let's focus on just the right-hand fork for the moment, as the processes at both forks are identical. Polymerases are loaded onto both the top and the bottom DNA strands at the fork. Because polymerases only synthesize DNA in the 5' to 3' direction, the two strands must be copied in opposite directions. The bottom strand in this fork is the leading strand. The polymerase on this strand moves continuously from left to right, synthesizing DNA as it travels. The top strand is the lagging strand, on which just a short stretch of DNA is made by the polymerase elongating in the 5' to 3' direction. After synthesizing this short stretch of DNA, the polymerase then dissociates and a new polymerase binds at the fork to elongate the next RNA primer. So priming and elongation are happening repeatedly on the lagging strand as the replication fork moves along the DNA. Synthesis is discontinuous. The short stretches of DNA that are made on the lagging strand are called Okazaki fragments after their discoverer. During the course of replication, these fragments are stitched together. When the lagging strand polymerase runs up against a previously made Okazaki fragment while in the process of synthesizing DNA, the replicative DNA polymerase 3 is replaced by DNA polymerase 1, which is 5' prime to 3' prime exonuclease activity. This exonuclease then degrades the RNA primer in front of it, synthesizing DNA as it goes. Once the Notice RNA how it is removed, completely two fit to function. Of DNA are joined by DNA ligase. Now the lagging strand has been elongated by one more Okazaki fragment. While this view of the replication fork is easiest to understand, in reality, how it really the leading and lagging polymerases are coupled and move in concert with the helicase. This coupling requires one DNA strand to be looped around so that the lagging polymerase can synthesize DNA in the 5' prime to 3' prime direction while moving with the fork. We explore this coupling in more detail in a separate animation. Much less is known about the details of the termination of DNA replication. Once the entire chromosome is copied, the two replication forks meet each other and are dismantled. The ends of the new DNA strands are then joined, again by DNA ligase. The two daughter DNA molecules now consist of one parent strand of DNA shown in grey and one newly made strand shown in green. Thus, DNA replication is termed semi-conservative. So if this is not called design, what is design? I just want to ask this question, okay? See how the, the, the machines are clamped, how they open, how they close, how the polymerases come in, how they move in the right direction, how in the other one they do like this, and then like this, and then uh, uh, an enzyme comes and takes off, uh, excises the RNA primers, and then puts a DNA daughter strand instead of it. It's completely amazing. It's completely, it's completely purposefully designed. Now there has been plenty of information removed from that video because, for example, you cannot see um, uh, 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 proofreading. And proofreading is this amazing capability that during this process that's happening at 10,000 RPM, okay, is taking place, and those are chemicals swimming in a fluid. Can you imagine that? Uh, errors happen. But there is an error detection system, otherwise we would have been all dead if, of, if all those errors were allowed to accumulate. And I want to take you to look at what is called the DNA replication proof reading, which is completely unbelievable.
So yeah, here we go. Proofreading polymerases have several checkpoints to prevent incorrect nucleotide incorporation during the DNA extension process. The first checkpoint is a result of the enzyme significant binding preference for the correct versus incorrect nucleoside triphosphate during polymerization. If an incorrect base does bind to the active site, incorporation is slowed, increasing the opportunity for the incorrect nucleotide to dissociate and a correct nucleotide to bind. Alternatively, if an incorrect nucleotide is incorporated, the proofreading polymerase detects the perturbation caused by the mispaired bases and shifts the 3' prime end of the growing strand to the polymerase's proofreading exonuclease active site domain, where the 3' prime to 5' prime exonuclease activity removes the mispaired base. With the mispaired base removed, the polymerase shifts the strand back into the polymerase domain and continues adding bases and extending the DNA. Fidelity is critical for many applications, including clone. So is that amazing or amazing or just amazing? Okay. The system, the system understands what is the proper language that is used. It understands that the A and the T uh, or the C and the G should come together and if something not does not come in its proper uh, matching it gives it it slows the process gives it an opportunity to pop out and if it doesn't it moves it out it fixes it and it, retur it returns to the proper process how on earth can this mechanism be generated through a random process a random mutation process led by a blind natural selection process no comment because what we have seen is enough comment now we have seen how we have storage and how we have the ability to replicate this information to replicate this program to move it from one place to another from one cell to another uh, create germ cells for reproduction uh, create more body cells of a specific tissue etc how it has um, very intelligent mechanism molecules do not think by the way the intelligence is from the designer. Now let's look at another thing. If you have a computer system, information is encrypted, is coded. And you only use the parts of the program that are accessible. Okay? Those parts of the program can be used when they are accessible. So, for example, if you buy a program and you have a specific license for it, parts of the program will not be accessible for you. Imagine that this is something that is part of our genetic system. And the control for this is called epigenetics. Um, again, I would like to uh, uh, draw your attention that uh, we are going to have our um, uh, Q&A session right after this one. And uh, you, you can actually even come live with me and have discussions and ask questions. I have some pre-sent questions that I'm going to ask answer first and then we'll do. So we need to finish in 20 minutes. So let's now check what epigenetics is. Uh, we'll first look in a video that shows a rendering at the molecular level, okay, of the double helix and the histones and something called acetylation, okay? And how the, these histones wrap the genetic material and they can give or not give access to part of the genetic material, enabling or disabling some of the genetic features. And this system, yes, this system is as intelligent. And this is part of the reason you have the same genetic material all over your body. However, the same genetic material on your skin makes the tissue a skin. In the liver makes it a liver cell. In the uh, bone makes it a bone cell. In the brain makes it a neuron, etc., etc., etc. Every one of them has the same genetic material, but each one of them has certain features enabled and certain features disabled through the uh, histone and um, uh, acetylation and methylation mechanisms. Let's, let's have a first glance.
The mechanisms of life simulated through supercomputers. We are inside a cell in a special part called the nucleus. Here we see some DNA, which is encoded with genetic information, including genes, the blueprints of cells. The motions of a vast number of water molecules have been calculated as well to accurately simulate the behavior of molecules inside the cell. DNA is like a long string composed of a double-stranded helix folded into very compact structures in the cell nucleus. The center of each of these structures is composed of a protein called histone. Each center consists of eight proteins, two copies each of four types of histones. Researchers have been working hard to understand their roles. This structural unit, formed by DNA wrapped around the histone proteins, is called a nucleosome. By treating multiple atoms as one single particle, we can increase the number of phenomena in our simulation. Human DNA measures about two meters in length. But it can fit in a tiny nucleus of only 10 micrometers in diameter by forming a fiber of packed nucleosomes called chromatin. For the genetic information to be read, the DNA has to be unwrapped from the histones. K-Computer has made it possible, for the first time ever, to calculate the force required at the atomic level to unwrap the DNA. It is also known that changes in histone state can alter DNA fluctuation. Histones have unstructured, flexible regions. These are called histone tails. When the histone tails undergo chemical modifications, such as acetylation, the structure of the nucleosome changes. For instance, we know that acetylation of specific parts of the histone tails loosens the chromatin structure, making the nucleosomes less tightly packed. The DNA has to unwrap from the histone proteins to allow other proteins to read its genetic information. Here, the tumor suppressor protein, called P53, is about to bind to the DNA. When the DNA is unwrapped, P53 can move along the DNA and read its genetic information. Chemical modifications such as acetylation and differences in chromatin structure affect the reading of the genetic information. This allows various cells and tissues such as red blood cells and nerves to be generated from the same DNA. The study of the mechanisms by which genes are turned on or off without changes in the underlying DNA sequence is called epigenetics. Studies using supercomputers to simulate the motions and shapes of molecules will contribute to the development of new drugs and research on regenerative medicine, leading us into an exciting new era. It is an exciting new era because it is God's design, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. This is why it is. And uh, one is just speechless after seeing this, these kinds of videos. The acetylation, the methylation, how his stones are, are, are wrapping and how they can unwrap and give access and how this essentially creates from the same genetic material all these differences in the body between your, your crystal clear uh, 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 eye uh, cornea to your uh, solid bones. All the same genetic material.
is, is producing. Completely unbelievable. And now let's, let's dig deeper into epigenetics. Let's look at uh, something called gene silencing. Okay, do you remember our P53 uh, uh, friend? Um, he, he is a very sophisticated friend. And we are going to see him later. But let's now see what if there is something that would happen and then it's now getting turned off. There is like this feature. We know when you have this, this app on your mobile and you are turning on and off features. It's the same program, but once you turn on and off feature, it looks different. It, it delivers something different. And here is gene silencing. So here's the gene being transcribed, and next to it you'd see acetylated histones, nice open chromatin, and now you catch these little methyl cytosines. Methyl groups is appearing, and here comes the protein. It binds and will attract this protein complex along with the enzymes, the deacetylases, and now acetyl groups are gone, and histones become tight chromatin closes wow. so it comes in no transcription takes factors, off what was making it open through wraps it in and it's closed and the gene is silent this gene cannot be expressed anymore this gene might be at some point of your life important some other point of your life it should shut up and the system just operates this way and these are all simplifications up to our current understanding. The real thing is much more sophisticated. How does the system know? These are dumb molecules. These are just atoms and molecules. They know nothing. The knowledge is with the designer, my brothers and friends. It cannot be more obvious than this. Now we have had a glimpse about, about what epigenetics is. So the, this, this DNA system is just not sitting there and, and things just magically happen and proteins are produced all the time. No. When a specific protein is needed, something enables the gene. It, the acetylation will happen. It will open up for reading and then it will be read. If you need more and more and more of the, of the protein or of that product, more and more and more genes will be uh, uh, opened up and then you have more and more and more. So there is control, there are valves. It's not just a system that is dumping proteins all over the place without, there is intelligence, there is central command. And this epigenetics is just the beginning of the tip of the iceberg because what is controlling epigenetics? There is a whole paradigm of signaling all over the place. Now, this, this, this is just where we're jumping from one place to appreciate the, sophisticated, the sophistication of the genetic system. Now, this DNA material is all over the place and it can suffer damage. And damage is a natural thing in chemistry. When you have any chemical product, when you have some food even, which is organic, it, it, it gets rotten with time. It decomposes. Okay, organic things decompose. Organic things are susceptible to damage from heat, from radiation, from uh, chemical agents, etc. How do we keep on living? Let's first look at the high level overview of what damage repair mechanisms can do with this magnificent video. Every year, one million women all over the world suffer from breast cancer. A healthy breast consists of different cell types. In the nucleus of the cells, you can find the DNA. Every day, the DNA of each cell is damaged thousands of times. If only one strand of the DNA is damaged, this can be easily repaired. PARP proteins bind to the damage and attract other proteins that repair the damage. When damaged DNA duplicates before the damage is repaired, a double-strand break can arise. In a healthy cell, this more severe damage can be repaired with the help of homologous recombination. BRCA1 protein binds the loose ends of the DNA and starts to unravel the DNA strands.
using the undamaged DNA strand as a template, the damage is then repaired. Finally, the two strands are separated, leaving both DNA strands error-free. In patients with hereditary breast cancer, the BRCA1 mechanism does not work. When a double-strand break arises in the cells of these patients, the DNA cannot be repaired. The persisting damage can cause cells to die. So we're not here to talk about cancer. We're here to see why we are not getting cancer every single moment of our life. It is because this unbelievably sophisticated system is fixing us all the time. Every single time God is fixing you. His design is there to fix you and keep you alive and keeps you from decomposing and every one of your cells becoming this miserable dead thing that you have seen in case that you have cancer. When you have cancer, damage repair doesn't work. So every single moment of your, of your time, you should be thanking and praising Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that you have this healthy body because we have millions and billions and trillions of cells, each has millions and millions and millions of parts. Each cell has three billion base pairs of DNA. How much damage happens every day? Millions of damages happen every day to the DNA and they are all fixed. Let's, I'll, I'll, I'll show you some more about this. Uh, um, I'll show you some more about this now. This will show you. Um, this will show you something very funny because we have seen this thing that is fixing it. This will show you what happens to prepare the molecule that fixes it. All right. So the preparation of the fixing mechanism, so that we 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 we, we ponder and we marvel on the extreme design that exists so that damage is detected and then repaired. And the extreme sophistication just to create the machine that you have seen doing this wonder to, to repair the damage. It doesn't, it doesn't just, it's not as simple as it was in this first infograph. Let's look at this. Every day, we are bombarded by environmental agents that damage our cells. Things like UV radiation and chemical exposure such as air pollution and cigarette smoke. Even the byproducts of metabolism, such as free radicals, can damage cells. These damaging agents can make changes to the DNA in our cells. DNA encodes the information needed to make proteins, which are the building blocks of our body. To keep two metres of DNA organised within the nucleus, it is wound around special structures called histones, much like thread on a spool. Damage to DNA can include single strand breaks, double strand breaks, changes to the DNA code. DNA kinks. And DNA sticking together. It has been estimated that an individual cell can suffer up to one million DNA changes per day. A special sentinel protein called P53 is recruited rapidly in response to DNA damage. P53 slides along the DNA until it finds a critical site. Finds. Do you know? Do you notice the terminology? It finds. It's looking for something. It's it a molecule. It finds to this state. site. P53 then sends the message to halt cell division until DNA is repaired. Or if damage is too it sends severe, a the message. cell is destroyed. P53 is it therefore sends a known message. as the guardian of the genome. And it takes decisions. There is too much damage. Let's destroy the cell. Is able to be repaired, a very complex and highly regulated sequence of events follows. 
which is orchestrated by three main molecular machines. This is machine number one, which is searching for a broken DNA end. Look at these nanorobots moving around the place, fixing things. Look at the histones. Look at how sophisticated the motion is. One machine after the other, uh, calling for each other to group, to, to correct the damage. I, is this there by accident? Is there anybody who has some brain Once that it has is found being the used? End, machine this one activates this molecule. Once active, the molecule participates in a series of interactions leading to machine number two. We're just creating the machines that is able that are able to fix the damage so that it can go and compare strands and do the magic that we have seen in the first video. And the machines themselves are marvel of creation. They are marvels of design. And the process Here it leading is again, to them is so this time activating another molecule. This is machine two, assembling into its active form. By the way, I will have some episodes about something called DNA machine wires that can help us understand how it knows that there is damage three. in the first place. It's completely unbelievable. And this will be done in cooperation with a renowned biochemist, actually, and I will be announcing Here it. Here is soon. machine three, which has also built a chain. The final molecule in this repair complex, BRCA1, forms from two identical halves which come together and bind. BRCA1 then begins the recruitment of further complexes that carry out the actual DNA repair. After a long chain of events not shown here, the DNA is finally repaired. Always long chain not shown here because it's too complex Because it's too complex, even this very complex presentation does not give it its rightful level of sophistication. And we are just looking at part of how uh, P53 knows that there is an error, finds the error. Why is it looking in the first place? Why does it need to take a decision? And it recruits all those machines. How come the components are there inside the nucleus in the first place? And they one stage after the other after the other until you have a, a hyper complicated machine that can go and double check two strands in front of each other, understand the it understands which is the damaged strand and which is the correct strand and builds the other strand from that one. What level of design and sophistication is this? And now we have just said a small a small comment. There, all of this is happening inside the nucleus. And all of those materials are inside the nucleus. This P53 is a protein. How come there is a protein inside the nucleus in the first place? Why is this protein in specific inside the nucleus? Well, guess what? Like any computer, your data center has a door. And the door lets in only the required personnel. And only the right people come out and the right people come in. And the right materials come in and the right materials go out. The products of the DNA process and the needed inputs go into the nucleus through a gate and this gate has i don't know fingerprint detection it has a password it has a passcode it has uh, 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 certain features of who goes in and who goes out and this exactly these are not just parables this is the reality of what happens and this is because the dna pores the small holes in the nucleus sorry the nuclear holes pores that small holes in the nuclear envelope are essentially like firewalls and antivirus and access control systems and admission systems find in computer systems. You can only get into the warehouse if you have the passcode and you have the badge and you scan it and you are, you are very well known to the system. Otherwise, you will not get in. And I will let you have a look at it now because we're running out of time because we need to do the, the Q&A. I just pushed the 15 minutes but we cannot push it more, any more than this. So let's have a look at the nuclear pores, which are analogous to firewalls. And let's first see 
uh, exporting of proteins, and then we will see also importing of proteins. We need proteins inside, like the P53, right? Let's see how this happens. The nuclear pore complex this is controls the entry and exit of large molecules to and from the nucleus. Transport of proteins in either direction requires several steps. Exportin is a protein located inside the cell nucleus that mediates transport of material from the nucleus to the cytosol. Exportin attaches to RAN GTP, increasing exportin's affinity for the nuclear export signal. The nuclear export signal is a short amino acid sequence on the cargo protein that acts as a tag for exportin to bind. The protein complex of exportin, RAN GTP, and the cargo protein is now allowed through the nuclear pore complex. In the cytosol, GTPase hydrolyzes RAN GTP into RAN GDP, causing RAN GDP to detach from exportin. Exportin loses affinity and unbinds from the cargo protein. Exportin returns to the nucleus as the cargo protein remains in the cytosol. Protein export is complete. Wow, subhanallah. You cannot get out of the nucleus unless you have the badge with you called export and otherwise the guy at the door will not let you out. You're going to just steal the warehouse and get out. You cannot just steal a chip from the computer and get out. You can only get out when the nucleus wants you to get out. And the nucleus is just a sum of dumb molecules. The system is designed for God's sake. There are robots, nanorobots inside there. There is a computer system. There is access control at the door. You cannot get in or out. But we have seen out. Let's see what about getting in. Now look at this, the pore. This is the pore from the other side now. The, 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 the top part is the outside and the, the bottom part is the inside. Look at the, this is a yeast cell. You know yeast? And, and, and this is made of like 30 different proteins. And look at the level of sophistication of those tentacles in it. You cannot pass by them unless you have the password for getting in. And the password is specified code on the ingredients that are needed to go into the nucleus. Nothing else. Look at this guy. It wants to come in. It is checked. Yes, it has the password or it doesn't have the password. If it has the password, it goes in. If it doesn't have the password, it does not go in. Look at this. It comes in. It's tested. It's frisked. <laughs> If, if it's the right guy, it goes in. If it's not, yeah, here you go. The guy goes in and, and, and the badge gets back out so somebody else can use it. Wow. Um, to go into the cell, uh, the, the, the cell nucleus, you have to have with you something called the nuclear, nuclear localization signal. You can read about it on the course page. The nuclear localization signal if you don't have it you don't get in and that's why viruses need to hijack machinery from the cell to be able to trick the nucleus and trick the defenses of the system to get in and out subhanallah nothing 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 is by coincidence um yeah exactly <laughs> access denied absolutely um so i think we have had um, a marvelous tour with the storage system the chromosomes the replication mechanism um the ligation and how it gets together how it's it's, it's error proof how the epigenetics control the features that are presented from the software from the same software in different scenarios we have seen how this thing is continuously repaired and how we should thank God every single moment for keeping, for sustaining us every single moment. These are things that happen, guys, at the, atom at the atomic and the molecular level. These are things that are at the quantum level, where there is uncertainty, where there is probability, where things will not deterministically happen. However, we are living. We continue living. We don't degrade. We don't decompose while sleeping. 
and it is not because the system it is not because the system is randomly created it is because there is a god one god who has created this undoubtedly no role whatsoever to randomness or natural selection otherwise random mutation and natural selection cannot start this cannot make it that sophisticated and cannot sustain it if somebody does not see this if somebody does not see this maybe he needs a new pair of eyes a new mind and a new heart only the blind cannot see it alhamdulillah so um everyone i i need to tell you two things because before we go to the live stream of the q a the first thing is that i would um, uh, uh, like to have every one of you on the um, telegram channel because the youtube algorithm is very clumsy um, regarding notifications etc etc um, so you just go to telegram and you just type finding truth channel you will find it and it's open access and here, here is how it looks like okay uh, uh, you can you can you can go there it's it's pretty easy okay g.me finding truth uh, sorry it's, it's badly written it's finding truth not finding truth okay um, and um, uh, second thing um, uh, please join me in the um, live stream for the um, Q and A. Uh, you can even uh, jump in, uh, uh, ask questions, and uh, we'll have an interactive session. Um, and if somebody wants to come up here on the platform live and ask live, we'll be doing that. Um, so Finding Truth channel, this is the Telegram. I would like you to, to come there. I have pinned already the address for the YouTube live stream uh, for the uh, Q&A. It's going to start uh in seven minutes from now so please join me there um here is it again if you didn't notice it uh yeah here you go you have it pinned on the top of the live chat on youtube all right so um this has been part two of um, session eight discussing the genetic system and today I have essentially, I had to repeat what I did in part one in better graphics and in um, part three, which will be inshallah uh, next Saturday, we will see the rest of it, the amazing transcription and translation and then, and then excision and, uh, um, uh, and then uh, protein folding and then protein transport process that continues, completes the cycle um thank you very much for being here and see you on the other end uh, for the q a session i'll be putting the extra now